You are listening to The Overthinker's Guide to Joy, episode 77. This is the one where I am going to go a little bit rogue and talk about something that is a current event. I normally do not do this on the podcast. I normally stick with things very related to overthinking and ways in which I talk about problems that come up in my coaching business and how I help clients and how I help people with overthinking, anxiety, depression, and how to help people manage their minds. But this week I am doing a special episode in honor of the Maui fires, which for all of you who have been watching the news, you know that there was a very, very serious set of brush fires on the island of Maui where I live. And it is an ongoing crisis. It is not just a natural disaster. It is a really very, very serious issue on every level, on a human level, on a psychological level, on a physical level. It is life. It is death. It is county and town and federal. And it is something that I am actually in the middle of dealing with as a member of a community. So I'm using my platform today to talk about what I know five days into this crisis, and I'm using it to update people so that they're in the know, and also as a thank you to all the people who have reached out, who have asked, are you safe? Is your family safe? And the answer is, yes, I am. And that is why I'm able to do this podcast today. But I think it is important for people to know that it is much more than just what you might see on the news or read in the headlines. I certainly don't have the broad perspective, nor am I the one fighting this battle. I am here as a community member to just share with you my experience and what I know thus far. So today's episode is just that. And thank you for listening. This is a podcast for overthinkers, overdoers, and overachievers who are tired of feeling overanxious and just want to feel better. I'm your host, certified life coach, Jackie DeCrenis. Hey there, and welcome back. So this is an unplanned episode in that it is not outlined. It is not scripted. I do not have an interview, although I tried to get an interview But this is the episode that I'm doing on the heels of the very, very, very tragic Maui fires, which broke out very, very early in the morning, Tuesday, August 8th. And right now I'm recording this on Sunday afternoon, August 13th. And let me just say, because we're only five and a half days into this, things may change again. I mean, by the time I finish recording this, there may be a lot more information or news or just new developments. So I apologize in advance for by the time this airs in a few days. And if you're listening to this, even after it goes live, maybe a lot of this information will be obsolete or irrelevant. But I just thought it was important for my Maui community and my friends on the mainland and my clients and for all of you who are watching the news and wondering what's happening, I just want to give you the up-to-date situation. So for those of you who are on my newsletter or follow me on Instagram or Facebook or watching the national news, you heard that at four in the morning on Tuesday, October 8th, my particular subdivision where I live, upcountry in Maui, was evacuated. We had firemen and police knocking on every door saying, you need to get out. There is a brush fire and it's coming towards your homes. We had no warning. We had no knowledge. We live kind of down a long driveway, so we can't see our neighbors. And it was pitch black and I've actually never been through this kind of fire drill. So I've been through a lot of hurricane and tsunami warnings, but not fire. So we grabbed our dog and our daughter and we all got in our individual cars and packed up whatever we could grab, right? Our wallets, our identifications. I had, for whatever reason, the presence of mind to grab my passport and a change of clothing and some dog food and a jacket because I wasn't sure if it was hot or cold outside. I wasn't sure where we were going. I didn't know if there was going to be rain or if it was going to be hot. And I actually didn't know how long we'd be gone. So typically in tsunami warnings, 
kind of ends after a few hours. They're pretty well timed. And gratefully, for the 15 years I've lived on Maui, every time we've had a tsunami warning, it was not too catastrophic. Sometimes a little water came into the bay, but nothing that was too disruptive. That's not to say people haven't had very big disruptions due to storms with mudslides and things like that. We have certainly had our share of brush fires, but nothing that has come this close to certainly our residential property. So we packed up our cars and even the police on our street were a little confused as to where to go. I think because everybody was shocked that there was no warning. This was all the result of gale force winds, hurricane winds that were coming quite south of us with no rain. So usually when we get hurricane warnings, we have wind and rain. And obviously if there's rain, there's less chance of brush fires. So that's never been a concern before. But this time we had just wind, extremely warm weather. It's August, very dry conditions, a lot of brush. And then of course I live on the mountain where there's a lot of forests and ranches and gullies and gulches and a lot of overgrown shrubbery. So it's kind of a little bit of a tinderbox. And with high winds and power lines, you know, being downed due to the high wind, pretty much anything could happen. So the fire started to actually up the mountain from me in a friend of mine's neighborhood. And then the firemen were basically going door to door to alert us. So when we went down the hill towards the beach, we realized there were no fires at that time. And fortunately, my brother was here and he lives in a different part of the island. And so we went and woke him up saying, there's a fire in our neighborhood. Can we come hang out at your house? And again, when I say hang out, we just didn't know how long we would be evacuated. We didn't know if it was for a day or two. We didn't know if our house would burn to the ground. We just really had no idea of anything. It's the middle of the night. It's dark. So we showed up at his house where the weather was beautiful and the winds weren't even bad and there were certainly no fires and he lives right near the ocean. So it was kind of a glorious day in paradise, which was very surreal having been woken up with a fire drill. You know, I'm shoving my dog into a carrier so that he didn't get loose and grabbing what I thought was important. And then of course, in your brain, you start overthinking, I should have grabbed a photo album. Thankfully, I had the presence of mind to take my laptop, which has a lot of my digital photos and certainly a lot of information on it. But I didn't think to bring two days of clothing. My brother had food in his house and markets were open, so that was not an issue. Although it could have been, again, had we not known that his neighborhood may have, you know, been in danger, but it was not. So very generously and very luxuriously, we stayed at his condo for the day and the evening and watched the news like hawks were following. And again, to the degree that there was news because with the electrical disruptions, like we had no power at our house. So it was pitch black and many cell towers were down. And we had heard that Lahaina, which it's the other side of the island from where I live, as the crow flies, it's like maybe 30 miles. And from my brother's house, maybe it's 20 miles. It's not a linear path, but it's another resort town and an old town. It's the former capital of the state of Hawaii. It was the old whaling village. It's 150 years old. Lahaina Luna is the oldest school, I believe, west of the Rockies. It used to be a boarding school. It's got a lot, a lot of history. So we had heard Lahaina was on fire too, as well as the mountains, which is where we were up country. But we had heard by 10 o'clock that Lahaina was contained, which is a very, very good thing because Lahaina is kind of one road in and one road out. So we were very relieved to hear that Lahaina was contained by maybe 10 a.m. We had no news about our house, although I was on multiple text chains with different friends and from different neighborhoods, and they're like, we're okay. We're being told we might have to evacuate, but we don't have to evacuate yet. But with Lahaina contained, we figured that the firefighters and the police could focus on upcountry, which is a little trickier because, again, we're in hillside and there's forests and pastures and farms and a lot of gulches, which has a lot of dry brush, which they call basically fuel for a fire, right? So that's 
anything from a tree to tall grass to shrubs to what have you. And because it's August and because it's dry and because there were high winds, those gulches can become inflamed very quickly. That fire can travel very quickly and then fire travels uphill and then it can go into these subdivisions of homes, not to mention the farm animals and everything else. So I'm trying to follow along on the text chains And then we're trying to watch news, although there's almost no news at this point. I mean, there's a little bit of local news. So we're kind of getting news piecemeal, a lot of social media news, people taking videos of their hillsides or their backyards and trying to text each other and what have you. And then later in the afternoon, we got news that Lahaina was on fire again. So again, that's the Whaler Village old capital, 150-year-old tourist town, lots of locals, lots of tourists, lots of restaurants and shops and businesses, very densely populated and right on the water. And that was incredibly unnerving. I texted a police woman friend of mine who is stationed in Lahaina. She got back to me and she said, it's burning. We are about to lose the town. And then I didn't hear from her for hours. Meanwhile, up country, I'm getting some reports that maybe some of the fires were out. Maybe it was safe to return home. We didn't know. Very smoky, very ashy, very unpredictable with the 40, 60, 80 mile an hour winds, depending on where you were. So we slept at my brother's, which was quite comfortable and very grateful, running water, electricity, even air conditioning in this really hot summer night. But a lot of uncertainty with many parts of the island burning. So when we woke up in the morning, Lahaina was basically gone. It burnt to the ground and it burnt what is known, which you've now, if you've listened to the news, the very famous Front Street, which is what had all the restaurants and shops and even nightclubs and things like that. And the fire just blew through and it blew through homes that were basically shacks, and it blew through homes that were multi-million dollar properties, and it blew through art galleries and jewelry stores, and people were jumping off the pier, the dock, the walkway in Front Street to get into the ocean to get away from the fire, and it was pandemonium. And it was pandemonium because there was smoke everywhere, ash everywhere, and no one really knew which road to take out. There's a bypass road and then there's a main road and the main road ended up being a fire trap. And a lot of people passed away in their cars, passed away in their homes. They just didn't even know. They said there were 30 people that died initially. And as of today, they are estimating it with a thousand people missing that it still could be in the hundreds, if not all thousand that are missing. So we can't even go over there as locals, only emergency vehicles and only people from the Red Cross and fire police, et cetera, are permitted over there. People have been chartering boats to try and bring in supplies from one port to the other. People have been flying small planes from our main airport to the West Side Airport to bring in much needed supplies. And they need everything from ice to water, propane, gas stoves, sleeping bags, pillows. People lost everything. I mean, it was as if someone dropped a bomb on Lahaina. That's the level of destruction that occurred, and it happened all in a few hours. So because they had no electricity and no water and no cell towers, many, many people couldn't communicate with loved ones. So people were basically trapped there or trapped elsewhere and couldn't get home. And they didn't know if their loved ones were alive, and many of them still don't. So meanwhile, we returned home. We didn't have electricity. My sister-in-law, who lives about a couple miles up the road, she didn't have water. So everybody had kind of their own situation. And I had other friends in other neighborhoods where it was drizzling, so it was raining. They had water. They had power. They had no evacuations. They had no fires. They had no smoke. And God bless them for that. And thankfully, it wasn't the entire island, but it was a huge, huge, huge portion. So we returned home and we started sweeping and mopping. We could not vacuum because there was no electricity. And then when it was nightfall, we went back to my brother's house just to get out of the darkness and out of the smoke and then came back the next day when power was restored, thankfully, and at least in our neighborhood. And 
what was presumed to be the fires were to be out. We felt relatively safe and we could start packing up, you know, non-perishables for the community centers where they were housing people who were displaced from the fires. And the community came together beautifully. I mean, it was extraordinary to go to the main shelter downtown and see how they had organized volunteers, Red Cross workers, Maui Food Bank, little bit of military. I don't know if that was local or National Guard. We keep hearing National Guards coming, although I haven't seen them. And then, of course, a few police and fire. And so people have donation lines. People have volunteer lines where they separate out the donations. Then there are people on cots trying to get some rest, trying to get some medical treatment for those who escaped. And then those shelters are all over the island. So they have them in Lahaina. They have them in what's called Wailuku and Kahului and Kihei and all over. So we kind of thought everything was okay or okay-ish. We didn't think Lahaina was okay. We knew that a thousand people, you know, were missing or dead. We knew that 2,700 structures were destroyed. We knew that the upcountry fires lost a lot of homes and a lot of forest land, but we knew the community was coming together and it was really, really beautiful. And people were doing their best to communicate however they could, social media, text, phone, if it was available people driving, you know, wherever they could, helping people pick up, opening their homes. And just in the last 24 hours, even though we were the original subdivision to be evacuated and actually the first to come home, it turns out that we have hotspots in the gulch that surrounds our subdivision and uh, the subdivision of 200 homes. And we're just one of dozens of these developments where people built, you know, suburban homes near next to, you know, forests or pastures or what have you. And there's hot spots in these gulches and there's just n- simply not enough manpower to man them all night. And at night is the problem because that's when the winds come down from the volcano and the mountain and kind of stir up the embers. And so we had one neighbor who's been firefighting. I mean, with a shovel and jugs of water and masks. And he and a neighbor have been basically putting out fires by hand with everything from jugs of water and fire extinguishers. And then he called me for help yesterday and said, we need more help, you know, however we can get it. Fire, police, volunteers, city council, federal, you know, FEMA, what have you. But there's so many hotspots. And as one neighbor said, the cavalry is not coming. So my neighborhood, who I know maybe five, six, seven, eight, nine people out of the 200, I just started texting people in a chain and just saying, hey guys, we need to be vigilant. We need to watch this perimeter, whether you get in the car and go up to the highway and look from below or whether you have access to the gulch, we just need to be aware of these hotspots. We need to call 911 or we need to put them out ourselves. And we need to let our council people know that we need probably federal aid. We need boots on the ground. National Guard or FEMA or Red Cross or someone watching these hotspots. Because while Lahaina is where the devastation was and where all the national news is and where absolutely the dollars need to go, we've got a situation up here with, you know, 10 or 20,000 people who have homes in these mountains who also need help. We don't need monetary help. We actually need boots on the ground at the ready to put out these fires if these hot spots or winds should pick up again. And there's a rumor that there's another hurricane coming, which may or may not have water with it. It could just be the winds again, which would be obviously devastating. So anyway, I am recording this podcast like from my gut. I don't have an agenda here. I don't have, unfortunately, don't have a beautiful message to share. I really am using this as a platform to get the word out that Maui is in trouble. We don't need you to come to Maui. (laughs) Eventually we do. This is going to be a very, very, very long process. The cleanup is going to be a long process. These fires getting put out is going to be a long process. Paying homage to those that have lost loved ones and businesses and history. And so the island needs boots on the ground and the island needs money. And anytime there's a disaster, whether it's 9-11, Hurricane Katrina, the horrible tornadoes that hit the Midwest, the hurricanes that have hit Florida and New York, the wildfires in Canada, 
it goes on and on and on. Natural disasters are always around the world. And we just happen to have had the most fatalities of any brush fire in a hundred year history of the United States. That's kind of insane for a population of only 120,000 people. So we have a lot of work ahead of us. And when the camera crews leave, which they will in a few days, we need the funds. We need Maui Food Bank, Maui Animal Shelter. There's a foundation called Hawaii Community Foundation, which is going under the subheading of Maui Strong, which has all the reputable charities on the island that are going to get people what they need because there are a lot of animals displaced. There are babies without formula. There are diabetics without insulin. There are so many people who have stepped up to help. There's a rumor, and I believe it's true, that Jeff Bezos, who obviously is the primary owner of Amazon, donated $100 million to a fund. I know Kai Lenny, who is one of the great surfers of the world who lives on island and was raised here. He donated money to get insulin shipped in from the big island to Maui for the people in Lahaina who needed insulin. Like I said, the American Red Cross is here, but we just need so much more. So this was not intended to be a charity podcast. This was just really to give you an update because I have had hundreds of people reach out to me through my community between social media, text, and my coaching community to say, how can I help? And while I don't currently need the help, my family and I at the moment are safe and back in our homes and very blessed to have just had dirt and ash and broken shrubbery and you know a couple of days of cleanup. We are hopeful that these hot spots in our neighborhood will stay dormant and that we don't have another evacuation and crisis. But for everyone else who has suffered from these terrible fires, if you want to do something, I would say donate to American Red Cross, Maui Food Bank, Maui Humane Society, or Maui Strong, a Hawaii Community Foundation that was set up. People need it. The island needs it. And for now, I will keep you posted on my Instagram. That's at Jackie DeCrenis, J-A-C-K-I-E-D-E-C-R-I-N-I-S, or my Facebook page, Jackie DeCrenis Life Coach. And, you know, I thank you all so, so, so much for the enormous good wishes, good vibes, prayers, reaching out to find out if my family is okay. And we are, and we thank you for all that kindness and kind words. And so many of you checked in with me on the daily. How is it today? How is your home? How is your daughter? How is your dog? How is your husband? How is your brother and sister-in-laws? Um, thank you. Thank you for all of that love. And I feel it. And I love you all for reaching out. And just know that as of you know, Sunday, August 13th, we are safe, but so many others are not. So please, 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 whatever you can do to get us those funds, get the island those funds and the help that these reputable charitable organizations can do to help those who truly are in need. I so appreciate it. So thank you, mahalo and aloha and bye for now. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Overthinker's Guide to Joy. If you're enjoying these episodes, please subscribe or follow this podcast so you can always be in the know when the next episode drops. If you would like to learn more about working with me as a coach, you can connect with me through my website at JackieDeGrenis.com. That's J-A-C-K-I-E-D-E-C-R-I-N-I-S.com.